Hello, and welcome to the Ink to Film podcast, where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm Luke. And I'm James. And this week, we discuss the second half of Diana Wynne Jones's 1986 fantasy novel, Howl's Moving Castle. Now let's turn the knob to black and walk through the door into nothingness. Wow, man, I, uh, there was a lot of surprises in the second half of this book that I was, that I was, I did not see coming. Is that what you felt? Yeah, definitely. We saw the movie first going into this book. Uh, the first half felt like it was very closely aligned with the first half of the book of the movie. And then it just like was completely different and and shocking and surprising. (laughs) And and it was all the more fun for it. Yeah. And I think, um, you, 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 we could probably spend a whole episode talking about those differences, but I think we're going to do that more with our movie episode coming up. Um, so if, we'll talk about differences for sure in this in this episode, but I don't want to I don't want to focus on that too much. So I think we will save a lot of that talk for later, but um, some of it's going to be unavoidable. And I think it's also really interesting for those uh, who might be just be listening along who haven't read this book to kind of hear what's in store here about stuff that's quite different. So last we left them, they were getting ready to go through the door into nothingness. And little did we know they were also getting ready to go through the door into the biggest change from the movie to the book, right? And uh, so chapter 11, they pass through this the, to, through the nothingness, and they come out in Wales, <laughs> just like our world. Um, and they're in a, they're in a town uh, with houses. We, I mean, we don't immediately know that it's Wales, but it it is revealed that it's like everything's kind of disguised as being a little bit like grungier, less colorful, less magical. Um, Hal's wearing a rugby jacket that says like rugby club on it or something. He looks like all threadbare and like just way different. And they go into this house um, and they find out that they're like, the house is called Rivendell, which is interesting because it's like a, almost like a Lord of the Rings reference. And so they go in, and there's this moment of, like, Sophie uh, and Michael, t- too, not understanding the world that they're in now. And they see these, like, quote-unquote magic boxes with like that are uh, rooted in these vines that go to the wall and stuff. So it's like TVs with, 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 with cables and, and all that. And, and then, you know, there's a computer, and there's, like, a, this, you know, family that includes uh, Hal's sister and his nephew and niece— and he in 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 yeah I I don't know I, I don't know how much of this I want to describe before I give you a second let's, let's I want to get your take on this just right off the bat how thrown for a loop were you so I definitely didn't I thought that we I did not think we were going to go into the somewhat modern real world of Wales Full Metal Alchemist was an anime that came out a while ago and it mm-hmm. it kind of deviated from the manga at some point the original the original run of the anime uh, deviated and it it. I mean, I guess it's kind of a spoiler. So if you haven't seen Full Metal Alchemist, the original, I think it started in like 2004. Um, it kind of ends similarly. It's like this magical world where alchemy is a thing and, and they're able to manipulate different elements. Uh, and he kind of ends up in the real world, which is like a mirror to that alchemist world. And uh, it reminded me so much of that just being like in a... Because, you know, you see like blimps and cars and all these things. And it's funny how characters react to that. It's just like a fun nod to the reader because it's like, oh, it's our world. We know that so well. And they're just a fish out of water. Yeah. So if I can get a little bit academic with it, um, it changes what kind of fantasy story this is in a pretty fundamental way. And it's a dramatic it's a dramatic shift because what happens is... Um, I, I can't remember the name of the writer, but I think his name was Min- Mendelssohn. Anyway, they outline the different types of fantasy. And up to this point, we've been in what uh, would be called like a second second world immersive fantasy, where you're just in this new magic world. Everything is not seen as spectacular or wondrous in the eyes of the characters. It's like at least somewhat expected. It's not earth shattering. Like they, they, they accept that this is the world that they live in and that there are wizards and that there are moving castles 
and it's not like they're going to go into shock and, and you know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's not insane. That's one type of fantasy, you know, that's Lord of the Rings. And then you have another uh, type of fantasy called portal fantasy. And that's famous for, like, uh, the Lion, the, Lit the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And that's where a normal person or normal group goes through a portal and enters a fantasy world. And now they're going to come in with the wonder of someone who is not from there and is instead experiencing this world for the first time and everything's going to be super wondrous to them, right? And so that's going to be a very different tone than someone who is born and raised in this magical world. So what happens in here when they when they get, it's 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 interesting because it turns this immersive fantasy into a portal fantasy in a way, although it's interesting too because we're being, it's the opposite of that it's turned on its head a little bit because it's the magic characters going through a portal into our world. Um, so yeah, it's it is cool. It has a nice charm to it, but um, it does dramatically change the way this story feels to me. And I never, it never returned to that pre. That's why it was really interesting that we stopped right at this halfway point by accident, <laughs> um, because I feel like the first half of this novel feels fundamentally different than the second half because of that change. Yeah, it, that was a lot. But did you, did you get what I was saying? In yeah, there? <laughs> yeah, I totally understand that. So I guess so. Harry Potter would be considered the the regular portal fantasy, right? Where he, yeah, portal he fantasy, goes through for sure. platform nine and three quarters, goes to Hogwarts, and he's mystified by everything. Exactly. I, I, See, at first, I felt like it was jarring. Like, I felt like I was like, oh, wow, this, like you said, like, this wasn't the fantasy that we were kind of promised or, or what kind of seemed like it was going to be. And and with that jarring sensation, I, I kind of was just like, okay, let's let's work through this. And by the end, once they jump back into the world, I thought it was an interesting perspective to give Hal, because Hal is obviously from our world, having gone to yeah. another world and become a wizard there. So, I mean... I think it just adds, I guess, more like relatability or I, it makes his character have more depth, especially because he has kind of like this muggle family that's like this non-magic family that's <laughs> back home that he has to kind of think about and protect. Yeah, I mean, and I'm not trying to say that it, it is fundamentally like a problem with this novel or that it's it's it was a mistake to do or any of those things. Um, I just think personally for me, it changes the novel. And part of that is going to be the baggage I took in having seen the movie. You know what I mean? Like that's going to be part of it. But I do think there's, there's like a first half established. And then it, it, when we pass through that, through that door, that everything's kind of turned on its head. And now we're faced in a world with a world where the rules are different, you know? And even after this, I mean, I don't know if I made particular note of it, but Hal makes like a reference to pop culture. You know, he just, it, there's like references he can't make in a wholly immersive fantasy world because we'd say that, you, you know, that thing doesn't exist in this world. And, <laughs> and instead he can say them because we know, oh yeah, he's from our world. So anyway, um, I don't want to linger on it too much, but it is a big difference here. Well, I thought it was funny to have Hal conjure up a computer game for for he's like i'll conjure up a computer game that exists nowhere else yeah so you're talking about he he's basically making a trade with his nephew and we come to find out that his nephew had been writing i think writing a poem or, or transcribing a poem from john dunn and it was his homework and that he like lost that poem and that came through the portal and what was, is the spell that was being read by sophie and michael in the last previous chapter. Yeah, the reason why they chased like the his shooting star was the poem. Exactly. Hal is trying to trade uh, tr trying to find out where his spell went because he had a spell that got that got swapped with this he got the homework instead. And so he there's this spell that is now I guess come through the portal and is on this side and he's trying to get it back. So, in order to do that, he basically offers his nephew Neil a video game in exchange and the video game is described in a way that's very like reminiscent of like a zork or something from the 80s like a text-based rpg like you are in a room there are four directions you can go <laughs> and so for it's like you are in a castle there are four doors each leads to a different place you know what i mean like that kind of thing i thought it was it was interesting that it was that it was described that way also i don't know this might be completely not true 
But I thought it was very interesting that we had talked about uh, her being friends with Neil Gaiman and this nephew being named Neil. I don't know. Did you make any? Did you make that connection at all? I didn't even think about that. You know, I, I think you know. Obviously, she's not like she's. Old, I think she's older than Neil Gaiman or was older than Neil Gaiman, but not that much. Not like he was a child in the '80s or anything like that. So, I don't know. I, I would be interested to know if there is anything there or if it's just a pure coincidence. But uh, the fact that they were good friends, uh, I, I wouldn't put it past her. Megan, uh, Hal's sister, is like scolding him for how he never gets a job and he's lazy. And Hal just kind of uh, kind of ducks away from her and he, he wants to go get in his old car. They go and they get in this car, which Sophie has this like, oh, it's a carriage without horses, you know, right. experience with it. And she's all, she can't, you know, believe how fast they go. And they go to this uh, teacher's house, Mrs. Angorian. And uh, when they get there, of course, this teacher is like super attractive and Hal is, is enamored with her basically off, off the jump. And he's like flirting with her, but she's being kind of very, you know, imperious and, and not really having any of it. And then uh, she says that she's heard of uh, she's heard of Hal through gossip and that he disappears and turns up unexpectedly. And that he has a certain reputation. Um, she also mentions that she has a a uh, fiance who's like she's waiting for to come to return or something like that, which becomes important to note later. She finds the paper, not knowing what it is, and she asks how. And Michael basically says, "Oh, it's a spell," <laughs> kind of like just lets the hat, cat out of the bag there. And she gets all upset and accuses him of working spells. Well, she I think she has like some notion that it might be a spell. Like she's like, that's what I thought it was. Yeah. And then and then uh they're like And she's very like spells are wrong and, you know, are like black magic and, and all this stuff. And Hal and Hal is like, Oh no, it's purely academic for research. I'm not actually gonna perform the spell. Yeah. We learned that what they had was a poem by John Dunn. This is where she um she reveals it and she actually recites the second, like, like the second third, like we got, we got the first third, is what was on the paper. And then she t- says like the second third, and she's about to say the final verse when Hal interrupts her because he can't, like, he can't stand it. He has to like, he's like struck, he's struck white, and he like goes pale, and he just basically runs away. Um, he seems very frightened of of this poem. And uh, I actually went and looked it up, and I have it, but I I think I'm going to save it for the end, um, and we can kind of talk about it as it compares to the story as a whole. Yeah, how's that sound? Yeah, because it kind of it's, it is in line with the what the story is about a little bit. Yeah, well, they reference it throughout, um, and it seems to be kind of yeah, like it, this seems to have been some sort of story based off of this poem. Um, but that's not clear, I think, until we talk about the rest of it. So, I think we'll hold off on that for a little while. But they flee back to the car, go back to the house, and Hal says, "Oh, the witch of the waste has caught up to me." And so they go th- back through the door and back into the moving castle. And that's the end of this chapter. Now, like I said, this is this chapter is like, I mean, like even talking about it feels really weird. My head's spinning almost from this because it's it's our characters who are these medieval magic, you know, fantasy land characters are riding around in cars and there's video games and, and TVs and all this stuff. Like, it's very odd. Yeah, I think it's interesting to see that Miyazaki kept it pure fantasy and didn't I mean, I think he did that on purpose. It, it kind of lends it to be more pure fantasy. Yeah. And we could talk about it more at the end, but I, I definitely, I think a lot of these plot threads are what is left as like an open question at the end. Like what, how, 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 how got here? Like how he became a wizard, how that works, how that like all that lines up with him having a life in Wales. All that stuff, I think, is like, not really explored. And so I bet, because I know that there are more novels in this series, I bet you're going to get a lot more of that in those novels. Yeah. I would suspect, at least. Chapter 12. Sophie tells Calcifer about well, where Hal is from, and the demon says it sounds like another world. They talk about the poem, which is said to be a curse from the witch of the waste. And Calcifer says that Basically, he will suffer if Sophie, if Sophie doesn't break the contract before the witch does. They head to Mrs. Pinstemmons together, and how, where Hal goes by uh, Pendragon. 
And oh yeah, here it is. Hal Hal makes a reference to Mad a Mad Hatter reference because he says um, they're talking about names, and she's talking and she says something about her her last name being Hatter, and he says, "Well, we can't all be Mad Hatters." And that's you know a reference to a Lewis Carroll work that wouldn't exist in a fantasy world, we would assume, right? And and instead we're like, oh yeah, he's making a Lewis Carroll Carroll reference. That's fine because he's from the real world. I will say that I didn't even realize that that I just thought it was funny that he called her a Mad Hatter and her whole family is basically Mad Hatters because he's de- dealt with Letty and all them. Didn't even realize that it was like a Alice in Wonderland reference. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, I think it is. I, maybe I'm wrong and Mad Hatter was a thing before that, but it was. I think it was made famous at least by Alice in Wonderland or through the looking glass. Um, so they arrive at this grand house. Um, and they meet uh, Mrs. Pinstemon, who's very grandly dressed in like gold and velvet, and very fine clothing, and she's very this very uh, like intimidating presence. And one of the most frightening uh, people Sophie's ever met. So they have everybody takes a seat, and Sophie Pinstemon says she's eighty six, and she asks Sophie how old she is, and Sophie's like, oh, 90. She just like blurts out a number. <laughs> And then Sophie's like, oh, or I mean, uh, Ben Stevens like, oh, well, you're quite spry for a 90 year old. And she's like, oh, yeah, of course I am. And so I thought that was kind of a funny. This is Sophie, you know, just wheeling and dealing these lies again, but in kind of a, I don't know, funny way that I think is entertaining, at least. Ben Stevens is like, oh, wow. Like, like doesn't re- I kind of felt like she didn't really believe her. Yeah. Well, and yeah. There's a lot of that, where Pinstemon seems to know more than what she's letting on quite often. She tells Hal and Michael to go outside in, in something that doesn't seem like Hal expected, and basically sits Sophie down. They start talking about the Witch of the Waste. Mrs. Pinstemon mentions that Hal was her last pupil and her best pupil. They talk about his suit when it's revealed that his suit has like a really powerful spell on it that glamours women to love him. Or to, you know, find him attractive or something like that. Uh, Mrs. Pinstemon's worried about Hal, worried that he's, like, going bad, essentially, in the same way that the Witch of the Waste went bad. And he asks, and, and Mrs. Pinstemon asks Sophie about what flaw she's noticed that's affecting Hal. And Sophie can only think that it's the, his contract with Calcifer that she's been trying to get to the bottom of, right? Mrs. Pinstemon basically says that Sophie has a gift where she can bring things to life. And this is the first where we get an I we get like confirmation or someone saying like you have a magic gift and you've been you've been using it without realizing it. And that magic gift like brings life to things. And she's not really shocked. She's like she's like, "Oh, it makes sense now cuz you know the the uh, hats kind of she gave them personality and and made them powerful and then uh, that's why they were so popular exactly and then pence them and also mentions like her walking stick that she has sophie's walking stick is like powerful and that it's like something to the, like in the line of like a wizard's wand she's made it into this powerful magic item <laughs> which is awesome it's a plus five staff of i don't know walking <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so Mrs. Pinstemon um, seems to know a lot about know a lot about her, and they talk about the, the how the witch was possibly entered into a contract with a demon herself uh, a long time ago, and that this contract has like made the witch evil. Um, so it seems like a lot of it is kind of implying that a deal with a demon is very bad, and um, it made the witch into what she is. And Mrs. Pinstem is worried that that's going to happen to Hal as well. Yeah, it's like cor- corrupting over time or something. And there we come to find out that like, it seems like Hal is pretty old. He's older than he looks, at least. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because he's he's like got spells that make him look different. Right. So he's kind of got that vain corruption going on already. Yeah. We also learned that uh, Sophie realizes that she thinks she did the enchantment on on Hal's like favorite suit that he wears all the time now. Like she accidentally while sewing it was like saying things about how it was going to attract all the ladies and stuff to it. And then that became true. Like it was an I I like that idea of this like accidental enchantment. I thought that was pretty fun. Yeah. But once you realize that you have that power, it's pretty OP, honestly. (laughs) Yeah. Um, oh, and then at the end of this chapter, Sophie agrees that she will still go see the king. It's kind of a it's it, it's a return to our fantasy world. Like we're all of a sudden we're back in the story that we were like used to being in, 
And to me, it was refreshing. It was like, okay, here we go. We're back into what I'm expecting. Like, this is what, I don't know. It, it, it was nice to kind of step away from Wales and get back into the world and, you know, that we're used to here. Yeah, I will say I was more comfortable when we were in the fantasy world. It, it, yeah. it just was nice to get back to it. And it's probably because I have that prior knowledge of the film. I think also um, I have like 5,000 questions that come up to me when they're in the real world. And whereas like, I don't feel like I have those when I'm in the fantasy world. Like I'm okay. You know, I understand what's going on here to some extent. Whereas whenever they go to that real world, I'm, I have so many questions, you know, and, and I'm not getting answers to them. So that's kind of frustrating too, in a way. Yeah, I agree. So chapter 13 there, uh, they head to the grand palace and very quickly uh, move through the palace. Michael and Hal both get pulled aside. And before you know it, uh, Sophie's standing in front of the king. It's just her and the king alone in the room. And Sophie's like really flustered at first. She's there to blacken Hal's name is, you know, what he's supposed to be doing. So she starts like basically telling the truth about him, um, like things that she really feels and has observed. And so she calls him, you know, her famous slitherer outer, which I'm not even sure I like that phrase, but she likes it. And so she's, she she keeps using it. Like at first I did, I felt the same way that you did, but the Slither Outer thing, it's like, it's unique to this novel, you know? That's for sure. Yeah. And, and, uh, she says basically that he lied cause he had told previously told the, the, um, King that he was going to help him. And she's like, Nope, he's a liar. He just made that up. She says that he's a coward, um, that he's afraid of the witch of the waste, that he's a mess. That he's like a glib tongued vain rogue and, and all this stuff just like really like laying into him and you can tell it's all tinged with truth right like it's all she kind of because she's also kind of mad at Hal like all the time and so this is her another moment of her being kind of mad at him and like taking it out and uh the king is like fine with it he's like oh well that sounds like he's the perfect man to find my brother um and who we we learn is like a general his brother's name is Justin Prince Justin and he's this general who I guess they're preparing for war um possibly to be invaded by another country and he wants his brother back because he's a general and he needs his help. Which, I don't know, like, that was kind of a weird choice, too, for me. Because, I don't know, like, y- y- he could just want his brother back. And it's weird that he's like, I want him back, but actually I need him back because we're about to get... You know, like, he needs him for his, like, martial knowledge and not just because he's his brother and he cares about him. I don't really like this king, honestly. Not a fan. I, c- I didn't know what to make of him, I guess, is, par- is part of my thing. I couldn't figure out what to make of this guy. Um, anyway, he, um, he says, you know, I'm still going to command Hal to find my brother alive or dead. And she's like, oh, well, my, you know, my whole pur- purpose here failed. And so she gets, she, she goes to leave and she gets like lost on her way out. And, oh, she runs into the man who had the duel. And he says that he won because he made his opponent sneeze. <laughs> so he did it. <laughs> and then he disarmed him while he was sneezing. So you, you called it, dude. I guess he I guess he threw it at him, maybe. It, the wind picked it up, <laughs> put it right in his nose. <laughs> yeah. I was so I, I got a good chuckle out of that, honestly, because we had talked about that, specifically that thing happening, and apparently that's exactly what happened. <laughs> yeah, she, she finds out that he's this count of cataract and all this stuff. So she's lost, and she heads out of the castle, but... Then she heads out into the town, and she can't find her way back to the castle, or the, like, Hal's Moving Castle, and she can't find her way back to the palace, so she's just wandering through the streets, and she can't find Hal or Michael. She starts heading towards Mrs. Penstemon's house, um, but on her way there, she just happens upon the Witch of the Waste, who's just, like, walking away from the house, and the Witch of the Waste is with her, it's like, they're, like, two, her two page boys. And Sophie thinks, oh, well, she's not going to recognize me because I'm not that important or whatever. So she just tries to, like, confidently walk past her, which, of course, doesn't work. The witch immediately recognizes her. And the witch um, reveals that she has killed Mrs. Penstemon because she came to, like, find out where Hal is. Mrs. Penstemon wouldn't wouldn't tell her. And she said, over my dead body. And so the witch was like, okay, and and killed her, Um, which, I mean, that's pretty dark. Did that surprise you? Yeah, without spoiling anything more specifically because of how the film plays out, it surprised me. She's just a bad... Yeah, this this witch is pretty cold and and not very uh, redeemable, really. <laughs> and yeah, so she just murders that woman that, I don't know about you, like, I, I liked that character. 
Um, so I was I was sad to see her go. She's kind of the Yoda, right? Kind of the Yoda of the story. Yoda, yeah, kind of a Gandalf, <laughs> if you will. Um, yeah, she's this older mentor who knows what's up for sure. The witch, yeah, basically menaces at Sophie, and Sophie has to say like, "Oh, I don't know where Hal is. I don't even know him. I'm just, you know, trying to head my way to the ca- to the castle or to the palace." And like, you know, makes this story up about that. And the witch is, doesn't really believe her, so she tries to call her on it. It's like, okay, well, that's where we're going too, so I'll walk with you. And so they all walk together to the palace again, and then she like watches her go up the stairs. And then so she has to go all the way through the stairs. And then all of a sudden she's like back before the king another time to, and saying that she forgot something she, want, she wanted to say. She says, uh, Hal will only look for Justin if you offer your daughter's hand in marriage to Hal, which comes out of nowhere. And she says she doesn't even understand why she said it. And then, of course, like uh, the king's like, that's impossible. And then he calls his like daughter out and she's this little toddler. Um, I don't know. This is like a bizarre turn of events here. I don't really understand why Sophie even went back to the king because I because oh so something I guess we didn't really mention was that I'm not sure if you mentioned it uh, the king appointed Hal royal royal magician yeah officially officially mm-hmm. so like he's like basically like duty bound to go find his brother and so she comes back trying to get him out of it blacken his name even more or, or I guess kind of threaten the king and the king she I guess it makes sense that the king would be like well it's not worth it. Not going to give my daughter's hand in marriage, but it's weird that that Sophie's put in this awkward situation. Yeah, why would she even bring that up? (laughs) Yeah, it's very weird. (laughs) So next up, uh, Sophie basically takes a carriage back to the castle. Hal learns that he's now the you know the official royal wizard. She describes what happens. He laughs about it and says, "Well, you know what, what? What did I expect?" And then this is when he says, "Like I'm going to go to Mrs. Penstemon's funeral." even though the witch is going to be there and she's going to like spot me, but he wants to go anyway. Like it's, he's like, it feels like he's honor bound to do it. Right. So, so the, he's, he's preparing for the funeral, but he also leaves to go back to Wales at one point, uh, at one point, Michael p- throws on this disguise cloak that turns him into like a red hair, red bearded man. He runs off to go see Letty. And then the knock at the door happens this time for like five minutes straight. And Calcifer says, well, it's not a witch. It's a flesh and blood person. And so Sophie's like, all right, fine. I'll um, throw this disguise cloak on and open the door. And when she does that, like, Calcifer starts laughing. And, well, as we learn later, it's because when she puts that disguise cloak on, she turned into a horse. Um, We don't know in the moment. So she opens the door as a horse. And outside is a greyhound who then, like, comes jumping in. So I don't just, you know, seeing seeing that play out in my mind is pretty funny. The dog basically morphs into a person says like a couple things very broken up like something about letty and needing to give a message and then then he transform into a red setter which it's i don't know i don't know why he does like different dogs it's kind of interesting that he does that like here he's a red here, here he's a greyhound and then immediately changes into a red setter right and then later he changes into something else i think it has something to do with this i think we come to find out that this is the dog from the beginning right that she like saved yeah, exactly. So it really just it yeah to throw everybody about which who it is. Yeah, you're right. Because if it was always the same dog, we'd put two and two together. Yeah, it's also the dog from Mrs. Fairfax's. Yep. This dog is a bespelled human um, that she doesn't know like why he's here, but he's she thinks he's been cursed maybe from the Witch of the Waste, and has been turned into this dog, and she thinks that this is um, Letty's other suitor that we've heard tale about who's like gone missing that this is him in dog form and so uh sophie tries to transform him back but it doesn't work and then so um she goes up to, to find hal and it seems like maybe hal's been kind of obsessed with this um lady from wales this teacher from wales right like he's kind of been trying to go see her but maybe not to any success and he talks about waiting for things to happen from the poem, but then he keeps saying, like, he's got to go to the funeral. He's also, like, it, he's, like, starting to get sick, kind of, right? He says something about going to Wales. He always gets sick going to Wales. That's right. Yeah, whenever he goes to Wales, he gets a, comes back with a cold, 
right? And yeah, so now he's starting to ha- have a cold. And he's starting to be miserable and kind of behave like a child himself again. When Sophie's in his bedroom, she looks out the window and she can see um, the window sh- like shows whales, and he can see his like nephew and and stuff like swinging and like playing, which is cool because that means he's always watching him and stuff. Yeah, it's interesting. So yeah, he's always he's got this window in his bedroom that shows whales. He also mentions uh, the three things in the poem that haven't come true yet. You remember right. that? He he mentions like the the he mentions mermaids, mandrake root, and yep. uh, wind to advance an honest mind. Oh, that's right. Uh, wine. Is it wine to advance an honest mind? I think it's wind. Wind to advance an honest mind. Because I thought, yeah, I don't know. It's one or the other. We can talk about it later because there's a thing that happens where I thought that that was that was it was wine, but maybe not. She starts calling the dog the dog man, um, which I, 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 that just reminds me of another book I've read where there's a very different character called the dog man. So it's, it's a little bit like jarring for me because I keep thinking about him from a, it's a Joe Abercrombie novel, a very different kind of fantasy. Anyway, so the dog man stays close with Sophie and uh, Michael uh likes the dog he returns he's got this box he's he's clearly been seeing letty right and he tells them about this empty building that used to be a hat shop and is now like for sale and so Hal's like considering moving the castle there and it's revealed that of course it is like the hat shop that sophie used to work in um so i don't know that it's another one of those moments of like coincidence i guess but i guess it's a small place so maybe there's not that many places coming up for sale very often and it also shows that, that Sophie's mom didn't want to continue the business without her making the special hats and stuff. She wanted to sell it, make her money. Yeah. So I don't know if I really said, but like the dog is like stuck and she can't do anything about his curse. So she just basically decides to let him like stick around. Okay. And there's like nothing to be done about it at this point, at least. Um, so the dog's just hanging out with him now. He's kind of becomes part of the group. And so they decide they're going to move the castle there and they're trying to move it to like get like to escape the witch and hide from the witch and maybe also the the king right and his responsibilities and so they're talking about moving the doors and finally how goes and they decide they're going to get the shop he he purchases it and they want to uh and michael is happy because he's going to be living closer to letty now and so this is when Hal finally prepares to go to the fu- funeral. He's got a really bad cold that he's suffering from. And while he's, like, getting ready, Sophie, like, hacks up his enchanted suit of, like, you know, glamour and makes this new one. But she makes it really small because I guess she doesn't have time to make it full size. And then she has Michael cast a spell on it to, like, increase its size to be Hal's size. And so she takes it up to Hal and she puts it, like, near him while he's asleep and is like, you know, here's your new suit. And then she like um, looks outside. She sees the boy playing catch, which is um, Neil. And Hal wakes up and um, kind of talks to her or whatever. And then she leaves. And then like at some point later, he comes down and he's put on this suit that has grown to be comically large. <laughs> and I just like that he is wearing it. <laughs> like he doesn't just come out like holding it like, hey, what's up with this? Like he comes out wearing the suit. <laughs> And it's so big that he's, like, lost in, like, its sleeve or something. Like, it's that big, right? I think, like, some of it, like, some of it's small and some of it's large. Like, one arm is, like, normal size and one arm is, like, massive and, like, all the way up the staircase or something. Yeah, well, and then he, like, he's, like, walking to the bathroom and, like, by the time he gets to the bathroom, it's, like, the legs of the suit start to come out of the bedroom, which is up the stairs. So, it kind of gives you an idea of how big it's gotten. So if it's like, you know, kind of magic going going wrong in kind of a, I don't know, fun kind of quirky way, um, which, you know, when, when this when this novel does this sort of thing, I think it is very charming. And I think it's a it's a it's a funny moment. He is kind of upset about the suit and he's he's, you know, because he wants to get ready to go to this funeral we've been hearing about for a couple chapters now. And this is when he comes out and he's got black hair and a black suit and he's like straight emo now. And he's like, I'm ready to go. And the way he's decided he's going to go is he's going to transform into a red setter, just like the dog. So he transforms into an identical dog, and they like have this like stare down, growl at each other thing. And uh, Sophie's like, "Well, if you're going to be a dog, why are you wearing all black? Like, what's the point?" And he's like, "Well, it's just you know, <laughs> Mrs. Pinstemon would under- would understand essentially is what he says. So it's it's all just for show for himself. Like, I don't know his vanity. I I don't, you know." 
it's Hal being Hal, I guess. It's for him to like show his emotion too. He wants people to realize like I'm suffering. Yes, even though no one's gonna see it. I mean, I guess other than Sophie and them, so maybe it's them. I don't know. Maybe that's who it's for. Anyway, he he comes back, and sure enough, he's like, "Oh, the witch found me." So, it, like, like she sees through his disguise. When that happens, uh, Calsfer just like goes, ch- starts turning colors and going kind of wild. And Hal and and uh, the witch like basically go outside and start fighting. And Sophie and Michael head out into the street to watch. And they shoot up into the sky or something, and there's like a huge black cloud with like snakes of magic and flashing light. And they have this big epic showdown in the sky, and all the people in town come out and watch. And the water of the sea starts like getting all disturbed, and there's like ships that, you know, like getting rocked around and stuff. And then these mermaids start coming out of the water, which is like out of nowhere. And the, the battle keeps going on. Um, at one point, Hal creates an illusion of a ship which he fools the witch into think like charging into, and then it's like not really there, so she just crashes into the water. And then these long-clawed cat sea lion monsters come out of the sea and start like chasing people in the town. And they all start running, and then there's like maybe some talk about maybe these are illusions. I wasn't really clear on like how much they were illusions and how much they were real. Maybe some were real and some weren't. Yeah, I think like there was one reel of Hal and one reel of the witch, and then the other ones were like, I guess Hal was trying to throw, like, trying to trick her into chasing the wrong one and getting away. Pretty wild to see, like, giant creatures and mermaids and, and like, some sort of, like... Yeah, the, mer- the mermaids didn't even do anything. They're just there for a second yeah. and then they're gone. Well, they're there for Sophie to be like, oh, that's one of the three things. Yeah, that's one. It's, they're like a harbinger of the poem, yeah. And then that's it. And then, so then, and then like, all the people in the town and Michael and, and Sophie kind of run out and then they see this big explosion, and then it's like all is quiet after that, and and all the people in town think that the like the wizard and the witch killed each other in that explosion. And so they uh, Sophie comes back into town, and on their way back in, the dog man starts chasing after this cat, and then the cat starts talking, and we learn that the cat is Hal, and he's like right outside the house. And so they go back inside, and Calcifer is super weak, and uh, you know almost out. They talk about basically like they had a really good fight with the witch, and you know seems like. Showed her what's for. <laughs> Showed her what for. I don't know. Calcifer talks about how powerful he. He's like, yeah, I think that, I think that the witch also has a like a demon, like a fire demon or something, and he's like, hers is like really old and powerful, and uh, right. he. It was cool to see Calcifer like like, he was kind of trapped in the fireplace, but lending his magic to Hal, so he was like multiplying and shooting all over the and changing colors and shooting all over the the hearth. Yeah, and I guess that doesn't that's something we didn't really talk about, but yeah, he he is like amplifying Hal's power and enabling him to have this like big crazy sky battle essentially, right? He probably wouldn't have been able to do that without Calcifer. So, and then we end this chapter by them by Hal basically saying like, "All right, it's time we really move." Uh we're and they and they 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 decide they're going to uh go through with their plan and get this uh get this new shop and and permanently move the castle. So at this point, we just wanted to take a second to talk to you about Audible. We actually have an affiliate link. It's audibletrial.com forward slash ink to film. And with that, you can get 30 free days for Audible and a free credit for any of their audiobooks in their collection. Yeah, I mean, you could use it to pick up something like uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which we mentioned earlier as being an example of portal fantasy. That's another book that's kind of in the realm of this one, right? Like it's this YA adventure fantasy story that I know my mother read me when I was a kid and, and always stuck with me. And, and it would be cool because the audio book is essentially that, someone reading it to you. Um, so I think it would be a really fun way to experience it. Yeah, and I know a lot of people have seen like the Chronicles of Narnia movies, more specifically probably The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. But mm-hmm. um, I've also read the novels, and, and the novels, in my opinion, are, are a bit better than the, than the film. So definitely check those out. It's a fun read. I agree, man. I had a uh, I had a Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe themed birthday party when I was in like first grade. And it was amazing. It's awesome. Yeah, we everybody came in through a refrigerator box that we set up in the front, and that was the wardrobe. And you passed in through it, and then you were in like the fantasy world of That's the party. That's so awesome, man. That's so cool. Is it, is it sweet? Yeah, my my mom totally set that up. It was great. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to get that book and you know maybe share that with your kids if you have any, or just experience it yourself, audibletrial.com forward slash ink to film and you can get that get that title for free and you'll help us out so 
this is the chapter where the, you know, chapter 17 is where the, the move happens. Uh, they repaint the blobs on the door to signify these new areas, um, except for the black. The black is left the same. But um, they move Calcifer by via shovel. They pick him up with a spade and they like take him into this new to this new hearth and put him down. And then the whole castle like melds with the hat shop in this kind of interesting scene where it, the two kind of become the one and the same, but different. Like the castle is now different than it used to be, and the hat shop is different than it used to be. Yeah, I really like that. I thought that was cool because it's like some it's like cool magic that you don't really see very often. And uh, Sophie notices while they're moving that while they're moving Calcifer, there's like a dented up lump in the middle of the logs. Oh yeah, which is something. Yeah, like a little black lump that's important. Yes. Yeah, that he seems to be like coming out of that, and like, and she thinks maybe it's him, right? Like his true form or something. So one of these doors is one of the doors is now going to be to here, and then the other one is going to go to this valley that's at the edge of the waste, and they go out and. Sophie doesn't really understand why he would choose that to be. And that's where the actual moving castle has moved to. Um, and it's like taken up, taken up residence in this like big flower field. D- during all this, Sophie asked Calcifer if he was ever a falling star. And Calcifer says, yes, of course he was. And that Hal caught him. And so uh, it comes out that Hal basically offered Calcifer a contract to keep him alive. And, and I don't know. That's, it's interesting because it kind of gets like, blown past pretty quickly but i feel like that's a pretty big revelation right right i mean it's he he caught calcifer in the same way that that michael almost caught one and he he using the boots and he the only thing is is calcifer really had like a want to live and it seemed like the other one that michael met didn't so calcifer was 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 ready to take any way out so he was like all right i'll take a contract if it means i survive longer so do you think that falling stars are all fire demons in real life yeah (laughs) (laughs) all right yes let's move along (laughs) um so oh so how goes uh goes to wales comes back with fairer hair now um he's changed his hair again and he makes a uh he makes a hamlet reference i don't know if he caught this he calls the skull yarrick um and and he he says something about something being rotten in the state of denmark i think which is both references to hamlet I didn't catch that. Yeah, my uh, my wife and I were just talking about this the other day, in which we we could um, I couldn't remember the name of the skull and and which which uh, Shakespeare uh, play it was from. She rightfully remembered it was from Hamlet, and then we we looked up the name and it was Yarrick. So I thought it was funny that right after this conversation, this came up in the book <laughs> I was reading. So I was like, holy crap! That's like during the whole "to be or not to be" speech, right? Like he's like holding the skull or talking to the skull or something. Yeah, I think, yeah, it definitely has like a solilo- soliloquy where he's talking to the skull, for sure. But yeah, this is another example of um, Hal making a reference that he couldn't have made right until we knew that there was this kind of overlap. Um, and so what happens is, and you know, I think a pretty clever turn here. They they turn the hat shop into a flower shop. And the, the business model is every morning they're going to go into this super remote field of like these amazing flowers at the edge of the waste. They're going to harvest them all and then they're going to immediately teleport them to town to sell them as like the freshest, most rare, cool flowers. And um, which is a good idea. And I think it, and, and of course it ends up being uh, being quite popular. Oh, the other door, the other color, I think it's orange. Um, leads to this mansion that was apparently at the edge of town and was like abandoned and so they kind of took up residence there we learned that uh hal says that the flowers were originally planted by solomon wizard solomon is in, in an attempt to like overgrow the waste and that the witch like hated that a lot of this wizard solomon stuff is interesting and i'm going to definitely want your take on it because i think this is another like thread where i don't feel like we quite understand what happened with with him yeah and must be something going forward that is revealed more. So chapter 18 comes along. They have opened they opened the flower shop officially. Hal keeps going back to Wales to talk to the teacher, supposedly. That's what Sophie thinks, at least. The shop is becoming really popular. Hal continues to wear all black, including like a black apron whenever he's in the shop. And when he's in the shop, um, Sophie thinks that he's using his like suit to make all the women love him. And so whenever he's in there, he, like, ends up convincing them to buy way more flowers than they intended to. And the whole time, Sophie's, like, being really grumpy and, like, 
is upset about something and she doesn't understand like what she's upset about and it's not really said for sure what it is what what do you think it is in this in this part here i think it's kind of her way of like denying feelings towards Hal a little bit yeah i agree with that yeah so i think it's just like mostly her in denial while also trying to be this like run the shop and all these other things yeah, I think she's grumpy about being an old lady and not being able to be someone that he could be interested in. And she's reading in all these things that he does, like him going to Wales as being about this teacher and and how the way he like flirts with all these customers. Like it, it's all getting to her and she's not self-aware about it at all. Like she doesn't seem to understand that that's what's causing it. But I, I think that's, I agree. I think that's what it ultimately is, is yeah. the blame here. Sophie started talking to the flowers to encourage them to grow. Yeah, that's true. She starts talking to them and... And using her magic on them to keep them fresh. And so she decides she's going to like to do some experiments. And she like grows, like starts doing growing some like flowers in their like little gardeny area they have. And she uh, first she grows a blue rose. And then like she's doing more. We, we don't know the details. And then um, Calcifer, it, we learned that Calcifer is bored and he wants co- company. So Sophie puts aside part of her day to like talk to him and he um, reminds her about the contract which she admits to having kind of like put off and not been focusing on and and she says that she she's worried that if she ends the contract it's basically going to kill Hal and Calcifer um, or be the end of them the dog man also seems to be gloomy he's kind of just like moping around a lot and Sophie like makes this pink flower bush it's like kind of like a, she's created like a new plant or like a new bush and um while she's growing that um how how comes out and like sees it and he's like oh what did you do and then they like they basically dig it he digs it up and finds out that it's the mandrake root and that's another part of this like curse um that she like made the mandrake root take flower or something i forget like what what exactly it is yeah basically that so around this time the scarecrow shows up again in town and it's like hopping past hopping towards the shop when sophie like sends it away and she just like yells at it to like go away really fast or something and then it just like hops on by and 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 doesn't like come in to see her she continues to just be like terrified of this scarecrow (laughs) it's she is this the point when she tells it to go like she gives it certain speeds to travel she's like travel 10 times faster or yeah, it's either this time or, or the next time, but yeah, it's one of these two times she she basically ma- makes it super fast. This is when um, sh- she's trying to get the dog man to turn back into a man again, and she has like a momentary success where he turns back and he can get out another sentence, and she finds out that he is Gaston, the man from chapter one who is with the witch um, at the very beginning, right, when they came to get a hat. Right after she learns that, Mrs. Angorian comes through the door into the castle, just, like, out of the blue. And she's here looking for, like, her fiancé or just wanting to see, like, where the world that, like, her fiancé went to is like. She seems, like, kind of, like, in on it. Like, she's not, like, completely just, like, oh, my God, what is going on here? Like, she's not as, like, surprised as I would have thought her to, like, expected her to be. Yeah, well, if she was if she was actually involved with ben sullivan who we supposedly take as the missing sullivan like wizard solomon yeah like different names i mean their names sound very similar but seem to be the same person yeah so she like walks around and and eventually she starts like trying to look at stuff and sophie's kind of blocking her right yeah sophie doesn't want her to go anywhere and then she grabs she picks up this guitar and she's like oh this was ben's guitar um, can you know I'm gonna take it with me and Sophie does not want her to take it and eventually Sophie kind of forbids her from taking the guitar makes her put it down and and kicks her out and uh, then Sophie feels a little bit self-conscious about her looks and how she feels like she can never compare to to Mrs. Angorian and I think this is another sign that you know there's some jealousy going on here and that's why she treats Mrs. Ang- Angorian so poorly here all right, so chapter 19, Hal returns. Uh, Sophie <laughs> demands to know which suit he's wearing because he's been, like, making them all look black, right? So she doesn't even know anymore if he's wearing the, like, enchanting suits or not. And th- and then this is the first time where Sophie reveals that the dog, just kind of like in a fit of peak, like, she's just upset, and she says, like, oh, he's under a spell, or he's, you know, he's he's actually a man or something. And so Hal, this is the first time he's heard this, 
and he gets all upset that she like didn't tell him and that um michael didn't tell him and and then like uh but michael didn't know he finds out but then calcifer did know and didn't tell him so he's upset with calcifer a little bit and then he basically pulls the the man over in front of the fire and is like all right we're gonna turn you back and just sets to reversing the spell with calcifer's help they they transform him back into a person we learned that he is a person who as Calcifer put it, most recently an- most recently answered to the name Percival. Percival says that the w- Witch of the Waste took his head off. And Calcifer says something about him being an incomplete man with other with parts from another man. And so he's this like apparently he's this like Frankenstein's monster creation here of like multiple people. Another moment that I was quite surprised with kind of how dark that is, or at least seems on the surface. Yeah, it was. I didn't know what to make of it in in this in this scene, but it comes to kind of make more sense later. Yeah, he does reveal that he was once called Gaston, and he's he was going around with the witch at that time. Sophie's very angry, and she decides she's just gonna leave, like leave the castle, and she goes out to the mansion door, and she's going to use this like new substance that she's made that kills flowers and weeds and stuff, and it's basically because she's angry. She's just like accidentally made a plant killing substance. And so she takes it out and starts using it on weeds. And uh, Hal sends Percival with her to just like like hang out with her while she's there. And so she starts talking to Percival. And she says, oh, you know, you know a lot more than you were letting on. Because he claimed to like not know anything else when uh, under questioning. Like he just couldn't remember anything else, right? And... He basically says that the witch wanted to know about Hal, and originally when they went there, they thought that she, that Sophie was Letty, who the witch had heard about as this other, like, powerful witch. And so basically she got caught up in, like, a case of mistaken identity, and, like, that's why the witch transformed her into the old lady, because she meant to transform Letty. Percival also reveals here that while he was a dog, he was able to talk to, he went to uh, Fairfax's place, found Letty, and revealed that what had happened to Sophie, to Letty. And so that Letty's been like worried about her. And this is, you know, the first time we, we know that anybody knows about this old spell, right? And then it's revealed that not only that, but Letty also revealed, like told Hal that Sophie was under a curse. And so now Sophie's furious because she feels like, Hal has known about the spell and has not been telling her, right? And so she goes back into the castle and also finds out that Hal has been eavesdropping uh, on their conversation they've been having. And so he knows he knows that she knows now. And he basically says that he was told by multiple people at different times that Mrs. Penstemon essentially knew it right off the bat. And As she would, because um, she's so powerful. And Michael told her, told him because I guess Michael Michael knew earlier and and told him, and then he also says that he spotted it himself. Like he's like, oh, I could have spotted it myself, which I'm not sure I buy. It could just be him bragging um, about his own power, but because he also didn't know that about the dog, so that seems to be kind of proof that he's not maybe not necessarily as powerful as he likes to pretend he is, um, or as perceptive at least. He mentioned something about her doing the spell herself at this point, which I think is interesting too. Like there's something that Sophie is doing to continue this spell. Uh, what what do you, what did you make of that? Like, what do you think she would be doing to continue this spell and why? Well, I mean, I feel like she's holding herself back because she has like this, she has like this failure mentality because she's the eldest and, and she's just like purposely holding herself back. And um, maybe it had something to do with like her denial of, of, like having feelings for Hal because he's such a despicable type guy in her eyes and she just doesn't like she's like I wouldn't even think of it so it's it's just kind of like keeping the status quo going because obviously at first up up until the point that she was in the castle it wasn't her fault that she was an old lady yeah it's like I think it becomes kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy like she's so down in the dumps about being old and like has accepted that as being the way things are now her magic is such that because she like her will is in line with that, that it just keeps it as being the case. Whereas maybe it would have worn off by now is the implication. Otherwise, Hal leaves and Sophie basically isn't talking to him and she decides that she's going to leave and everybody's mad. (laughs) And then we go into chapter 20 here. 
this is where okay so hal returns from wales and he's been with his rugby club re- reunion and he's drunk and he comes in and he admits that basically he says i'm not drunk and then he like walks into a couple walls and then he's like all right i am i am drunk i was lying <laughs> and then um this so i don't know like, and he's like he's being kind of honest here I thought maybe this was part of the curse because I thought it was wine. Now maybe I just misheard it because we listened to an audiobook, so maybe I misheard it. But I thought it was it was like wine honesty, and so I thought maybe he went and got drunk, and that was like part of the curse. That's funny because like that fits, but I actually have a different read. I'll I'll tell you about it when it comes up later and see see what you think. Okay, that sounds good. All right, so they go out to the flower field to do the harvest. Percival says he remembers how the field used to be. It was like much smaller, and that Hal has basically made it into this big giant field of flowers that it is now and michael the whole time is like following percival around staring at him because he thinks that he's justin uh prince justin and he's convinced so we learned that back in town another festival is underway and so they are going to sell like a ton of flowers today and so they they sell these flowers and make a ton of money and sophie's basically decided this is going to be my exit I'm, I'm about to leave and but before she leaves she goes to talk to calcifer and while she's talking to Calcifer, a knock comes on the door. And Calcifer says, oh, it's flesh and blood at the mansion. So Sophie opens up the mansion door, and it's Fanny. Fanny Hatter, of all people, has come by this uh, mansion to speak to the new occupants. And we come to find out that Fanny has like married some rich guy and has now li- lives like at the edge of town in a mansion and has just happened to come by, right? So she comes in and they and they actually um, have like kind of a touching reunion where Fanny says how she, how worried she was and and Sophie feels like her perception of Fanny was maybe a bit unfair and they kind of hug and make up honestly. Well, and Fanny also realized like recognizes her even though she's like you know ninety years old or seventy five. Oh, that's old. a good point. Yeah, yeah, she's not thrown. Like she immediately looks at her and goes, "Oh, that you're Sophie, but you're old now." What's happened? to so, you? So yeah, that is pretty cool. She kind of thinks that she like overworked her, which is like absolutely impossible to have aged seven <laughs> years. And <laughs> that's uh, that's a lot of work, some hard labor. So yeah, Fanny's telling her all about the man she married, and then as that happens, Martha comes in with Michael. At the same time, Letty shows up with Mrs. Fairfax and Percival. So in a kind of very convenient turn here, all of everybody shows up. Now, I wrote very convenient because I was a little bit like, hmm, you know, this is weird that everybody's showing up all at the same time out of the blue at the castle. But there is an explanation that comes later where Hal basically says he um, he orchestrates this. Right. And it was not. I mean, it's kind of to be expected in this kind of novel, too, because it's like we want everything to wrap up nicely in a bow. So it's it it is convenient, but she kind of explains it away. Yeah, and well, he's the whole time he's supposedly sleeping upstairs. He's just like snoring the whole time, which I did I, the whole time. I'm like, I don't know if I buy this. Like, he's always got something up his sleeve. So, yeah, I don't, I don't even know if I believe it ever. Like, I don't know if he was asleep. I don't know. What do you think? Do you think he was actually sleeping through this? No, I don't think so. <laughs> anyway, yeah, he orchestrated this. He reveals later, so it's all very designed. But while this is happening, another person arrives, and this is uh, Mrs. Angorian also shows up. Now, this one, I don't know. Maybe he didn't plan on this part. It's very weird. So Mrs. Angorian shows up and feels very out of place. So Sophie, like, like, lets her go out into the field of flowers door and hang out out there. Well, yeah, and Sophie feels bad because earlier she kind of treated her poorly when she had shown up. So she's like feeling bad. And like you said, kind of like just go hang out in the nice field of flowers. Right. Yeah. So she kind of puts her out there, puts her out to pasture. (laughs) And then uh, she starts explaining how all the doors work and stuff to her sisters and Fran and Fanny, Fanny, Franny. Um, (laughs) And (laughs) while that's happening, the calcifer just all of a sudden like wakes up and starts shouting about the witch. Right. And they go up into the bedroom and they see out the window that the witch is like, coming after the niece and nephew while they're playing it's kind of i don't know i kind of had trouble like picturing exactly what's happening but they're the witch is like beckoning them and they're all like coming towards her yeah or something and she looked a little different i think in the in the version of her in wales it seemed like it was different than the what we've seen elsewhere 
Um, and Megan's also there, his sister also being like pulled in towards the towards the witch. And then at the last second, like Hal Hal shows up in his you know rugby jacket, and he just like charges at the witch, who turns and runs, and they just run and jump over a fence and like disappear. And we don't actually see them have any sort of confrontation. Now we hear later that maybe this was all a ruse. I don't know, but I was a little bit like I felt a little bit cheated. Like I wanted to see like what a battle between them looks like in the real world versus in a magic world. Because we've already seen them do battle with in the sky and the clouds and stuff. Is that what it would look like in the real world, or is, would it look like just like two people punching each other? <laughs> uh, it's funny because it doesn't seem. It seems like it'd be maybe not punching each other, but like something different because her magic wasn't working. She could have just like in in the magical world, she could have just like sucked them towards her or whatever. But instead, she was like using some sort of like glamoring come towards me. Yeah, but like, like something technique. was happening. Though, something. Too, it was right? definitely magic. So it would be interesting to see like this alternate magic. This sort of like. Because it was almost like you could just say like she was persuading them to come over to her. Yeah. And maybe it was like that's some yeah. sort of magic. Yeah. And this is what I'm saying when like I feel like I have a million questions about the real world. <laughs> you know, so many questions about how this all works. But anyway, so they, they just run off. They basically run off a screen. And so we don't know what happens there. And but kind of bizarrely, Fanny and Mrs. Fairfax both start talking about wanting to like clean, clean house bedroom, which seems completely like, I don't know out of beside the point of anything at this in this moment but that's what they want to do then they um they go down and i forget who does it but somebody accidentally opens the door to tr- i guess to try and go find um mrs angorian and the scarecrow is at the purple door waiting and it starts like talking through the skull and the guitar in like a weird way and it's not talking to them but it's like making them make weird noises and like chatter and stuff and calcifer says that it's like talking and trying to say that it means no harm and it's waiting for permission to come inside but it wants to come inside and so this is the first time where sophie like kind of takes a step back and and realizes that the scarecrow isn't as scary as she originally thought and she decides okay i'm gonna let it come in and so she invites it in and it comes inside and basically the skull melts into the turn the turnip head of the scarecrow and becomes one and then it starts talking which i think is like i don't know it's a pretty cool like weird moment i don't know it's a weird magic moment but it's pretty neat and i don't know so now he's still a scarecrow but he's got this skull like melded with his turnip head and he starts talking fairfax also says like oh this is a magician's golem like she seems to recognize that and names it as such um percival just faints when this happens by the way <laughs> he's out the the scarecrow mentions that sophie talked life into him like when he was like out of energy or something at one point in his mission and we're kind of le- like trying to figure out what exactly the mission is that the scarecrow is on and but before he can finish saying it calcifer gets like taken over by the witch and starts speaking for th- for her and the witch says that she has mrs angorian in her castle in the waste and basically like come and get her or something <laughs> And, and and Michael goes, oh, my God, the Scarecrow was sent by the witch to get inside, and, and, and that succeeded. And that, that's where Chapter 20 ends. I mean, it's cool that we get, like, this this showdown kind of being set up where she's like, I've captured the princess. She's in my castle, and, like, it's all going to play out like a fantasy yeah. novel would. And yeah, should. or, like, Mario. Was it Mario or, or Zelda or something? Yeah. <laughs> princess Peach is in another castle. So Sophie, in her like stubborn way, just throws, like, goes and gets the seven league boots, puts them on. Uh, the scarecrow is chased off by the others, um, which I don't know. It felt a little bit unfair to me. Like they just assumed that the scarecrow was all part of the trick. But I don't know. Like I, I almost also kind of bought it. Like I don't really know what to make of the scarecrow because he's very different in the book than it is in the movie, right? Yeah, very different. So did you think that the scarecrow was like this like Trojan horse to get inside and, and get the get the witch inside no i thought that we were finally going to realize kind of the similarities between the movie version and the book version but not yet yeah so sophie takes these seven league boots and just decides she's going to go out and face the witch on her own in kind of a bizarre i don't know like i guess she's just fed up at this point so she's like i'm just gonna go handle this myself well yeah she's i feel like she's like coming to her own so maybe she feels like she can handle a witch fighting witch fighting witch battle i don't know yeah it seems pretty foolhardy to me it definitely I don't was, know about yeah. you she i mean yeah we knew what was kind of gonna gonna start to go down when she when she got there 
Yeah, so she 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 heads out into the waste, finds this castle um, or like palace, and when she gets there, she takes the boots off, goes inside, and she's only got her like trusty plus five walking stick of power, <laughs> and she she goes in, encounters the witch and the two page boys, and the the witch is like for some reason hugely tall and wearing a white dress and feels and is like very weak. And she sounds very tired and frail, and she seems kind of frightened of Sophie. And then, but then, in like a last moment kind of thing, she turns the page boys into these orange blobs that then fly into Sophie and like stick her to a pillar. What? What? I, do you? Can you tell me why the witch is like frail here? Like, what's going on? Is this what? Is this after fighting Hal last time? Maybe she's was left weakened. Well, maybe. I do. We know for sure that the witch ever really showed her true form until this point like i feel like if she'd been sending out like some sort of different forms of herself or maybe it was just in disguise okay, so i feel like so you think this is how she really looks that's how she really looks and maybe it's like like having a, a fire demon is starting to weigh on her and like take a toll okay. on her life as well yeah that makes sense so these page boys are not actually page boys they're emanations we learn and they've stuck Sophie to this pil- pillar. And so Sophie just basically gets <laughs> pushed aside, like, no big deal. And so Sophie's sitting there trying to figure out how to get out. She's going to use her, like, walking stick, maybe. We learn that uh, she, uh, the, the witch brings this man out who has no head. And he's sitting on a chair. And that's, like, what's left of Prince Justin. But he's still alive. He's moving. And he's still alive with no head. But the body is also a mix of Solomon and Justin. It's not just Justin. And she, we, her plan is she wants Hal's head to put on this body to make, like, the perfect man. <laughs> and that perfect man is going to become king, and then she's going to be queen, like, by his side and rule over the, like, kingdom. <laughs> and <laughs> I was not expecting this. <laughs> Hal is a piece of, a, like, a Frankenstein's monster of a... a bride for for the witch here it's pretty surprising yeah we i guess we kind of knew that they like he had scorned her right like he had like been interested in the witch the waste at some point and like scorned her so maybe she was like ultimately she was still interested because he runs away when when the women get interested so she was still interested and she's like she's gonna i don't know that was confirmed but someone basically i think someone did talk about that being a possibility yeah but and that does seem to be quite possible here too right that this lines up with that so um, the witch um, basically like walks away from Sophie, and then while Sophie's like while she's not looking, Sophie starts to use her stick to like get the the orange stuff off of her head and shoulders and kind of get free, but she doesn't even get free before the like the fortress wall blasts open and the scarecrow comes in, like triumphant, duh, duh, like and it's and we've learned that he's got like super speed now yeah. because of the, what what Sophie like did to him because he's rad. He's and, a- yeah turnip head he showed up to fight the witch at the end (laughs) he shows up and he starts having a magic battle with the witch they literally like have this like cloud battle again very similar to what what they had with 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 Hal. and then speaking of Hal, he shows up and he comes in and like basically puts the final like touch like final hit on essentially like he they've been battling and he comes in and finishes her off and turns her into a pile of bones (laughs) dusted (laughs) <laughs> gone just a pile of bones but they're, they're like the scarecrow's looking for her heart but it's not there and then hal says like oh you're not going to find it here and it's going to be with the demon which i had kind of not been thinking about i'm like oh yeah so the demon is elsewhere still and has her heart so they go back to they free sophie and then they go back on this like like some sort of storm wind or something and there is like a scene in the movie I remember where they're like walking in the air. Yeah. And this seems to be that scene or something similar, right? Yeah. This is also what I was talking about with the the wind. This was the third part of the prophecy being fulfilled. It was him being honest okay. on the wind. So like while they're running, she's like, uh, she's asking him about some stuff and he's being very honest with her. And then she's like, comes to the realization that she's like, he's being honest. This is the third fulfillment of the prophecy. Uh, see, I, I was thinking like, you know, in vino veritas kind of thing. <laughs> like it was just like, that was my, my, I, either way he, he, uh, he's, he's being honest at some point here. They ride the wind back to the castle. And then when they get back, I do. I, I did make a note here that he's being honest. So yeah, I don't know why I was. I, I had thought. I had thought it happened earlier, but you're right. I think this is really when it happens. 
Oh, so Hal says that he had been relying on Sophie. So it's weird, too, because it's like this is kind of another moment of Hal kind of saying like he knew what was happening all along. And he had been like he had expected Sophie to keep the demon out and that she let her in. And I don't know, like, it's weird. It's like almost Hal saying like, oh, I knew Mrs. Angorian was the demon all along. I don't know how much I buy it, but he was definitely like it definitely all worked out for him in the end. I'll say that. So when they get back to the castle, uh, Percival's still unconscious. Fairfax and Fanny are uh, cleaning Hal's room. And uh, Hal goes to, like, pick up the guitar, but when he reaches for it, it just explodes. And Mrs. Angorian appears, who has hidden inside the guitar and is in the moving castle. And uh, Hal tells Mrs. Angorian that, the, that, her, that her witch is dead, but she doesn't care. Um, and Mrs. Angorian reaches into the hearth and pulls calcifer out in her hand and then she basically says like if she controls calcifer she controls hal and she starts to squeeze calcifer and while she squeezes calcifer hal just collapses unconscious on the ground so this is like a, a cool moment where like our major like powerful power player guy just just wiped out taken off the board right and so now it's sophie versus this fire demon she basically like tells her stick to uh, attack Mrs. Angorian, but no one else. And so the st- the stick just like starts smacking, smacking the witch o- or the demon over and over again. And the first time, I think it smacks smack, smacks uh, her in the knuckles, making her drop calcifer. While the stick is like slapping Mrs. Angorian, um, Sophie realizes that this black lump is actually Hal's heart. Mrs. Angorian is trying to flee, and Percival like basically pops up and opens the door. And I wasn't sure like is Percival helping her in this moment wasn't really sure yeah i'm not sure so the door opens up but then she can't get out because the scarecrow is in the doorway like blocking the way yeah. um and then so she uh the, the the demon grabs michael and starts using michael as a shield from the from the staff so the staff like can't keep hitting her yeah because the staff is like so sophie went to grab calcifer and the stick has been like attacking attacking on its own yeah sophie um basically cuts calcifer off the heart like nips nip, i wasn't sure did she actually use scissors or is it just like like a magical cutting i'm not sure when she cut yeah she could she it's it's described in a very like like a sewing kind of way like she just like or like maybe like cutting flowers or something like she just cuts cuts some calcifer off the heart um with her will too though like she talks about how she has to will it and think about it and when she does that, like, Calcifer just shoots off through the chimney. Like, he's just, like, out of there. Well, she and she also says, like, she gives him, like, a little... Because she can give things life. She's, like... She, like, says, like, have another thousand years or something. Like, gives him another thousand years of life, which is what I was talking about earlier when I was, like, OP, overpowered. <laughs> have another thousand years. Um, so, when, so she's kneeling over, over Hal, and she takes the black lump and, like, puts it on his chest and tells it to go back in... And then it does. It just, like, goes back into his chest, and he wakes up, and he's got his heart back now. He stands up and basically captures, and it grabs um, the old witch's heart, which the demon had. Yeah. Where, where does he get it from? It was in, exactly. in Angorian. Because like, like how Hal's heart was inside Calcifer, the witch's heart was inside of Angorian, who was the, de- the, the fire demon. So he, like, is okay. able to, like, say a spell and, like, pull it from her, and then he's, like, holding That's it. That's right. So he pulls out the witch's heart, and then he, like, crumbles it in his hand, killing the demon and killing, I guess, the last of the witch, right? Yeah. And dispels the demon. So Justin addresses uh, Fanny here. They, they're, I don't know. There's a lot of, like, characters having conversations about, like, plot important things about how they're going to, who's going to, you know, do what and how they're going to return back to the kingdom and who's going in and, and, and all this stuff. But while this is happening, like Hal and, and Sophie are having this moment of like staring into each other's eyes and they can't hear anything else. And they are holding hands and, and Hal says, I think we ought to live happily ever after. And, uh, Sophie basically says like, but it, she thinks life with Hal is going to be way more interesting than the stories make it make happily ever after sound like it's going to be. Yeah. It's just, it's a it's a really you know tender heartwarming moment here, and it was interesting to me because I feel like I hadn't been rooting for their romance as much as I think other readers probably would. Like I suspect a lot of readers are going to read this and constantly be rooting for them to get together, but for me that was it was almost more like a subplot the idea that they might end up together. Mm-hmm. I like this moment. I just I wonder if I don't know how did it strike you? Was it was it more like something you'd been waiting for? 
um, a little. It seems like a little more than you uh, felt that, but I will say that it, it like it hadn't really sold me on it until he like went and saved her, and they were running back, and he was being honest, and then this scene goes down where they're just ignoring the world, and like it kind of worked for me. I liked the yeah. scene. I enjoyed it. No, I mean it does work for me. I guess I just wasn't as like will they won't they kind of thing. Yeah, like the whole time I hadn't been thinking about their relationship as much as this like ultimate goal. Like I like I wasn't sitting there going like I really want them to get together. Even though like I kind of knew that that's where the movie goes, yeah. but like I don't know, still it just um I mean, I agree with that. This doesn't feel to me like 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 a like a truly just this like romantic story about two people winding up with each other. Like it feels like there's a lot of other stuff going on and that's like part of it, but not maybe the main thrust of it in the book version. Yeah. I agree with that. I think it's more, and it's more just like characters. I mean, it works. They work together, but it's not like they only exist to be together, kind of. Yeah, and I mean, like, I think it does color the rest of the book once you know that it happens. You can look back and say, well, clearly, you know, she's perfect for him. She's a really good, like, balance to his flaws, and they work well together, and they, you know, have these feelings for each other without there being a physical component because she always is this old lady. Yeah. So there's a lot in there to, like, say that this is what this story is all about. But I think it's only, like, I don't know. I didn't really think about that until after the fact. Like, until after, at this moment where I, I look back and go, oh, yeah, I can see that this is this is a really good way, place for this story to go. Yeah. You did. You mentioned that she turned she turned young again, right? Oh, yes. In this moment, she turns yeah. young again, right? As all the, the commotions yeah. going on, she, she just kind of, I guess, lifts the curse from herself. Yeah. Which is, why, why do you think, why do you think in this moment she's able to do that? See, I have a very concrete answer for the film, but for for the mm-hmm. for the book, I I think it's just finally that she's like accepted that, like she's happy with herself either way, and kind of that she's like she deserves it, like she deserves to be with somebody that she loves. Yeah, I like that. I I, I agree. It's like it's thinking she deserves it and like giving herself credit, and you know she bests this fire demon, right? And like maybe maybe in this moment she's kind of accepting who she is and and all of that lifts the curse i buy that yeah um and so and then we're basically at the end here um calcifer comes flying back down the chimney and lands back on the hearth and basically says um yeah he's gonna hang around he's gonna hang around as long as he can leave like you know come and go as he pleases and kind of says like ah, it's wet out there <laughs> but you know he wants to. He wants to. He wants to stay here, and we get the we get the impression that he missed them and and feels like he wants to stay with them, and you know they've kind of got a little family going here. Yeah. So it's nice. It's this found family thing, right? That that, that you get in so many other, so many other stories that is really really powerful, where these these strangers have come together and formed this new family, right? Yeah, I was so happy when Calcifer came back, and he came back like it was funny and awesome. All right, so I have the poem here by John Donne. I thought I'd read the whole thing, and then we can kind of talk about how maybe it applies to the book, right? So the poem's called Poem Number 6, Song, by John Donne. And remember earlier, Hal said something about it being a song, which is an implication that maybe he did already know that this was a poem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go and catch a falling star. Get with child a mandrake root. Tell me where all past years are, or who cleft the devil's foot. Teach me to hear mermaids singing, or to keep off envy's stinging, and find what wind serves to advance an honest mind. So you're right, wind, not wine. (laughs) If thou beest born to strange sights, things invisible to see, ride ten thousand days and nights, till age snow-white hairs on thee. Thou, when thou returnest, wilt tell me all strange wonder, wonders that befell thee, and swear nowhere lives a woman true and fair. So this, to me, seems to be very much about Hal and his, like, searching for a woman, and, and we got Sophie maybe in there with the gray hairs. I don't know. I'll continue. Now, this is the final one. that actually doesn't appear in the book. The final verse. If thou findest one... Let me know. Such a pilgrimage were sweet. Yet do not, I would not go, though at next door we might meet, though she were true when you met her, and last till you write your letter, yet she will be false ere I come to two or three. 
it seems like some people kind of think that this is uh this is kind of a, a an angsty poem by a guy about women and like how he can't trust them and how they're not true and how it takes two or three for him to find the right one right right um so this seems to be very kind of indicative of Hal's attitude right definitely yeah um but i thought I think it's interesting that there's there's talks about these doors and their white hairs and and all this stuff to where I don't know like what what do you make of that? So uh, this just like came to mind when you're when, once now that you asked that um, it's very interesting because I feel like Diana Wynn Jones probably read this and was like I want to make a story a fantasy story and incorporate a lot of these components and it's kind, yeah. and like it's kind of indicative of what Miyazaki did with her work. Like he was like, I want to take what she talks about, use most of it, cut it up, make it my own, put some new like like other like underlying themes in there, um, and I think that's just cool. But the poem in general is like like you said, definitely. I feel like it's it's like Hal's viewpoint through most of the story. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a, it's it's a very old poem, so it's got a lot of this like archaic language and Thoust and Beast and all this stuff, which can be a little confusing. But yeah, I think I think you're right on, and that and that's kind of what I got from it too. I think this is a rough blueprint that she adopted to to write this story, um, kind of based around. Um, so yeah, apparently we we owe this all the way back to John Donne. That's something I would not have known <laughs> had I not read this novel. So that's pretty cool to think about that. You know, somewhere distantly, John Donne wrote a poem that eventually led to us getting Hayao, Hayao Miyazaki's amazing anime film. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> I would have never known. I like that she also homages it in, in the text. You know what I mean? Like, that's awesome that yeah. she did that. Yeah, for sure. All right, so um, any, what, what other general thoughts do you have here about this? Um, I, I know we, we talked quite a bit about it, um, but I'm curious to think, or to, what did you think of this novel as a whole as it compares maybe to the movie, but also just on its own, uh, of its own accord? How does it stand up? So um, through the first half, through our first episode, um, it felt very, um, I mean, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it, but it felt like something that I'd read before, right? And then uh, mm. as it went on, it started to do different things and, and kind of take certain tropes or certain things that happen in, in fantasy stories and kind of spin it in certain ways. And there was a lot of like unique things that I haven't seen in other books, but at the end of the day... I, I read Harry Potter first and it felt very much like a Harry Potter experience and like I love Harry Potter so that's saying some really good things for, from me it, it's and we talked about it in the first episode it's nice to just have something that's just like you you mentioned it was like a palate cleanser for you uh, because of the other projects we had done and, and it's nice to just go into something wholesome and like real that you know will be around for a long time people will always be able to enjoy this and I, I really enjoyed it. I, I it was a different experience than I thought we were gonna get from a novel that that Hayao Miyazaki based his film off of, and I, I enjoyed it more than I thought I would. I would say that I still think that I enjoy the film more, but that's just me all over. Like, there was a lot more kind of like meat on the bone for this story versus the anime. But I like something about that short sweetness of of the Hayao Miyazaki anime. I'm I am um, I agree with a lot of your points. I I think that there was some really interesting surprising stuff that happened here in the second half um not all of it landed perfectly with me but um definitely surprising and not at all as i was expecting from that first half i'm gonna withhold judgment on the the movie um we can touch back on this after we watch it because it's gonna be a different experience now watching it after having read this book you know like it's gotta be so i'm gonna be really curious to see what i feel about that movie now after after we uh after we've just read this i will say i'll go into it with an open mind and, and in our next episode I'll, I'll follow up and let you know for sure which one i like more okay sounds good all right man i, I think uh, that's probably good for this book episode um we're gonna we're gonna watch this movie soon and then we'll be back next week with our movie episode which will end our run here for the uh for the house moving castle so if you wanted to keep up with Ink to Film, we're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. It's at Ink to Film. We would love to hear from you. So if you got any feedback for us, um, even if it's just letting us know you're following along or, or if you have certain things you'd love to hear us talk about with the movie episode, uh, send us feedback to inktofilm at gmail.com. And also, if you wanted to help us out, the best thing you could do for us is rate and review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And subscribe. And subscribe, yeah. Yeah, you know, a review like uh, this one from Czar, which comes to us from iTunes, five stars. 
great first episode, well thought out, and a great review for those of us who have not read the book. The information and the dialogue was jam-packed with useful thoughts, providing depth and understanding. Keep it coming, guys. Great job. Yeah, thanks for that, Zara. That's that's great. Yeah, thanks, Zar. Appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we wanted to say thank you to Ross Bugden. Uh, he's got a great YouTube channel where he's got all these different songs. Um, we used him for our intro and outro music. And uh, also thank you to Audible for their uh, affiliate link, um, audibletrial.com forward slash ink to film. You can get that free credit and those free 30 days. And using that affiliate link will really help us. So thank you to them. All right. Thank you for listening. I'm James. Yeah. And I'm Luke. See you guys next week. Bye.